Colossians chapter 3. We're in the middle of a series called Growing in Christ. Our typical practice is to pick a book of the Bible and walk through it one section at a time. So this is a, a little bit unusual. We're taking a theme and taking uh, different topics and asking a, a particular passage of Scripture to address that topic. So the last couple of weeks we've, we've studied growing in abiding in Christ. We studied growing in the Word. Last week, growing in obedience. And this week, growing in godliness. Growing in godliness. And I'd like to read from Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read a lengthy section. We won't be able to dive into every detail of this passage, but I think the overview is very important for us and for this theme. So let's read it together. And as we do, let's, let's remember what we heard a couple of weeks ago, that this, this is the treasure. This is the feast. This is the glorious inheritance of the Christian, that we get to enjoy God's Word, that this is something delightful to us, that as we come to it by faith and as we anticipate the Spirit, as we open our lives to its authority, that there is something infinitely valuable here. God is speaking to us. Let's read it with that anticipation this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory." Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Father, please bless the preaching and the obeying of your word. One of my sons loves Legos. He loves Legos. And when he gets a Lego set for his birthday or Christmas, he can't usually even wait for the rest of the event to be over before he races off into some private room somewhere to dump it on the floor and begin the building process. Actually, I think he finds secret joy in being able to show as much progress as quickly as possible and rushing back to declare to us, it's finished. I have made this much progress, this wing is completed, or this tower is finished, or check out this cool turret that we created. There's a certain joy in showing the the rapid progress that he has made, and I, I love watching his passion. He is not content for it to stay in the box, not content just to have it, not content for the wrapping to cover those pieces. He wants them out, and he wants them to be built one brick at a time, one section at a time, one page of the instructions at a time. He wants progress to be made. 
I want to have that view of godliness. I want to have the view of godliness in my own life that I must see progress made. I want to see godliness grow one moment at a time, one day at a time, one year at a time, certainly, but certainly grow. Change should be happening in the life of the healthy Christian. Godliness should be increasing. We are called to grow in godliness. And Paul, throughout his letters, but here in Colossians 3, is addressing this category that to be called to Christ is to be called to godliness. It's to be called to grow in godliness. It's to be called to increasingly take on the image of our Redeemer. I want to impress the point of this passage on our hearts this morning, and God wants it to be impressed on our hearts, that we would have that that eager joy, that sense of, of racing towards growth, that sense of dissatisfaction with all the tools of growth left in the box, that sense of dissatisfaction with complacency and status quo and the thing we built yesterday being enough. We want to have that childlike Longing to see it grow. To be called to Christ is to be called to godliness. Now, as I said, we're not going to be able to look into every detail. This passage is lengthy and dense. Like Ephesians 4, it is a master class on the topic of Christian godliness. It is worth detailed study, but I think this overview will provide some helpful categories in how we can think about growing in godliness in our life, what this call entails. I think this is important for those that are here perhaps not convinced that Jesus is the Savior and they have not claimed Him as their Lord. It can be very helpful for those who have just begun this walk of faith and those who have been Christians for decades. All of us need to hear the call of Colossians 3, that to be called to Christ is to be called to godliness. I'm going to divide this into three sections. They're fairly obvious. I think they're in the text. You'll see they're beginning in verse 1. The three sections are the heart of godliness, the war, the war on sin, and the beauty of character. The heart of godliness, the war on sin, and the beauty of character. Let's begin with verse 1. The heart of godliness. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The heart of the Christian is a very important place to begin. The mindset, the focus, because one major danger when we talk about godliness is to think that our godliness is the major focus of our heart. But true Christian godliness begins with a heart focused on Christ Jesus, on His kingdom, on His glory. That's the difference between Christian godliness and common normal morality in a number of other religions or even just normal neighborliness that we might see in our country, our culture, and different cultures around the world. No, this is not simply improving ourselves. This is not simply trying to be a better person. This begins with a heart set on Christ. Paul assumes that if they have been raised with Christ, which he assumes to be the case, they are to seek, to long for those things that are above. And the focus here is not on altitude. He's not looking at some kind of a space travel. He's focused on the different realm, the realm of God's revealed glory in heaven. Where Christ is, he said, seated at the right hand of God. That place where Christ is seen in his full glory and dominion and sovereignty as the Lord of heaven and earth. Set your minds, he says, on things that are there, not on things that are on earth. He does not mean that we can't be earthly minded in any sense, serving like we have this week, those that in need. He means that this world, as it's comprised of those who try to live life apart from God, who try to act as if this upside-down kingdom is right-side-up, that try to love the things of this earth as a replacement for God. He says, do not set your heart on those things. And the reason you should not 
is not just because it's proper and right for you to do so, but actually this has reference to you, what Christ has done in you. For you, he says in verse 3, have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, obviously, we have not died physically. We're here listening and reading this passage. Paul is calling to mind the truth that God has so linked his people to the person of his son, that Jesus is their representative, that he died to take their place, and he united himself to us so completely that his death truly counted as our death on the cross, and his resurrection truly counted as our life, so that we can truly say our heart of hearts, the center of our being, is found in Christ, the crucified and risen one who reigns from God's throne. So, the heart of godliness is fixed on Christ, on what he has done to die in our place and to rise to glory, on his sovereignty and the certainty of our future hope in him. That is the heart of godliness. That reduces to ash any view of godliness that is fixated on being superior to someone else or impressing God with our good works. It is the driving engine of true godliness. All else is legalism and morality, which leads ultimately to hopelessness and despair. The Christian gospel fixes our mind on Christ, who is our substitute, who has united us to him by faith, who has risen to glory, who calls us to himself completely by grace, and then as that, as our focus compels us to live our lives in obedience to him. If we do not set our hearts on Christ and his kingdom, our efforts at godliness will fail or completely be a facade. Apart from Christ, all morality is like a tablecloth for a pigsty. Apart from a heart set on Christ, united to Christ by faith, where Christ is the substitute for their sins and their punishment and the security of their future heart, apart from that, apart from that heart driving our faith and our godliness forward, apart from that view of godliness, all morality, all efforts at morality, all efforts at bettering ourselves is tablecloth on a pigsty. It is worthless. It is worse than worthless because it is boasting in our shame. It's crucial that we distinguish true Christian godliness from common Western morality. It is the cheap cousin of true godliness. We cannot fight the temptation to idolize this world unless our heart is set on the greater glory of Christ in heaven. We cannot fight the hopelessness of guilt unless we remember that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. We cannot resist the pull of sin unless we remember that Christ defeated the power of sin and gives us hope of his resurrection life. Unless the heart is fixed in the right place, fixed on Christ and his heavenly kingdom and our union, our certain union with him. Our growth in godliness is as useless as trying to push a car up a steep hill without using the engine. Sadly, this is often how we relate to our growth and our morality. We think much of where we could grow and should grow and little of Christ, our federal head, our representative, our future glory. As one old writer would say, we need to take ten looks at Christ for every one look at ourselves. I would urge all of us to ask the question, are we looking much on Christ? Are we seeking the things that are above where Christ is? Obviously, this has implications for our idolatry and our earthly mindedness. But I want us to focus on this concept that we are, we are fixing our eyes not on a place we earn to get, but on a person who has secured our place there by his righteousness and by his death. Sadly, we, we do not often fix Christ as the heartbeat of our growth in godliness. So we say, stop being angry to ourselves or to our spouses or to our children. 
but we do not direct their attention or our attention to Christ as the only reason and hope that, that, that anger can stop in our lives. We say, stop being lustful without remembering to fix our eyes on Christ's glory and our eternal hope in Him. So, here's the application of this first point. Read about Christ and His eternal glory. Do not read the Bible primarily as a book to tell you what you shouldn't do or should do. Read it primarily as a book that reveals the glory of Jesus Christ, that pearl of great price, that treasure of all treasures, that glory that outdazzles the tempting seductions of this world. Read much about Christ. Think about Him in His heavenly glory and His perfect representation place representing us before God's throne. Think about Christ. Think about it in the morning. Think about Him. Review in your mind that He died in your place and He rose to heaven. Think about Him when you are thinking about how you can grow. Think about Him when you're thinking about how your children or your spouse can grow. Think about Christ before you think about your need for godliness. Fathers, tell your children about Christ and his solution for their sin and not just about the importance of godly behavior. Husbands, make sure that your wives are thinking on Christ and his heavenly glory and the finished nature of his work in their place and not first about all the ways they can grow in godliness. Wives, make sure your husbands are spending more time thinking about the work of Christ in their place than the work they still have to do on this earth. Measure your godliness by this. Is it Christ-centered, heaven-saturated? Is it fueled by gospel identity? Set your heart on Christ, and then, and only then, will you be positioned for Christian godliness. Don't lay that tablecloth over the pigsty of morality, it will lead to hopelessness and despair. Look to Christ and let his glory fuel your growth. If you need books to read about Christ, we'd be happy to give you a hundred solid gold options. Don't Google books on Christ. Go back to those that have served Christians for decades and hundreds of years. Read John Owen on the glory of Christ. Read Jerry Bridges on the gospel for real life. Read J.I. Packer growing in Christ. Read, read Spurgeon as he describes Christ and him crucified. Read these kinds of solid gold resources and let your heart be warmed and filled with, with joy and glory as you consider and contemplate his greatness. The heart of godliness must be set on Christ. But if one danger for the Christian is legalism and moralism, the other danger is apathy and presumption. And so Paul moves on from contemplating Christ, calling them to seek Christ above all things, to the war with sin. The war with sin. Put on then in verse 5, put to death therefore, verse 5, put to death rather, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Put your sin to death. Very important to understand this sense in Paul of the already and the not yet, what theologians call the already and the not yet. There is a sense in which certainly we have died with Christ, and by faith we have been raised with Him. That is truly our spiritual condition. And yet, as we continue to live in this fallen world, sin, though its power is broken, though its condemnation is passed, its desires and its activity remains. It continues to tug our heart away from the new self we have been given in Christ Jesus. And so Paul can rightly say, though you have died with Christ, you are still to put your sin to death. 
And this violent metaphor is meant to shock us, it's meant to awaken us, because we tend to be gentle with our sin. We are gentle with our sin when we should be violent with it. Paul uses this idea, put your sin to death, because we are often harsh and impatient with others, but often gentle and patient with our sin. We are often condescending toward others and yet understanding toward our sin. We are often ambitious for our reputation and yet compromising toward our sin. We take it easy on our sin. We listen to its excuses. We are sympathetic to its explanations. We are gentle and understanding and patient. And we coddle it and tell it it's not that bad, don't we? So Paul uses this shocking image to wake us up. Put it to death. Kill it. And if you're shocked by the violence of this, you're supposed to be. There is an enemy in our hearts that is not meant for diplomacy. It is kill or be killed. It is crush or be crushed. It is slaughter or be slaughtered. This is a do or die kind of battle. Be at war with your sin, Paul says. This is not a compromise. This is not a cakewalk. This is not a walk in the park. This is not a diplomatic conversation across the table. This is not, I'll give you some and you give me some. No, this is fight to the death. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. He lists out some examples. I don't think it's exhaustive, but it's meant to give a sampling. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These things are so devious and so deadly and so evil that they must be put to death, not caged, not permitted, annihilated. John Owen who is probably the best place to go if you want to study this topic of fighting sin, says, let no man think to kill sin with few easy or gentle strokes. He who hath once smitten a serpent, if he does not follow on his blow until it be slain, may repent that he began the quarrel. And so he who undertakes to deal with sin and pursues it not constantly to the death. Be killing sin, Owen said, or it will be killing you. It's important that we understand sins not only in terms of acts, but also in terms of desires. Did you notice that in this list? Very, very important. Sometimes I think our temptation is to focus exclusively on sinful acts. So the outburst of anger or the act of immorality and to forget about desires that are displeasing to the Lord, evil desire. And here's a massive category, covetousness, which is idolatry, just wanting and craving that thing that we do not have is sinful in the sight of God. We tend to think in terms of acts we know are wrong. We don't always tend to focus on those desires that grip our heart even if they have no external expression. Wanting something that God has forbidden or craving something that God has not allowed is an expression of sin. In other words, we need to get very familiar with the evil desires of our hearts and not just those actions we know are wrong. Talk to any military strategist, they'll say one of the lessons that they are taught is you must know your enemy. Well, this enemy doesn't just work in actions, he works in desires. And sometimes, for those that have been Christian for a while, that's the main way he works. Because they've learned enough to not give in to actions that are overtly sinful, and so they give in to desires. They crave things. They think things. They want things, and they never bother to put those desires to death because they assume it didn't give way to actions. Listen, God doesn't just want godly actors. He wants godly hearts. 
He wants hearts that are wholly devoted to him. He wants desires that are pleasing to him. It's not enough to say, well, it's good I didn't scream at my children. Yes, but you shouldn't idolize their obedience. I'm glad I didn't commit road rage. Yes, but you were cursing them in your mind. And guess what? God hears thoughts as shouts in heaven. I'm I'm glad you didn't act out on that desire, but why was the desire there? Why was the craving there? Why was it entertained? Why was it coddled, considered? Why is it that it bothers us so much when our preferences are contradicted or our priorities aren't the priorities of others? Why is that desire there? Why do we covet the things we do not have rather than express gratefulness for the things we do? Those are the desires of the heart. Often, Christians neglect asking, why do I want these things? It's especially true for things that are not explicitly sinful. But why do I want them? The Ten Commandments don't forbid coveting of a neighbor's evil or his idol. They, commit, they, they forbid coveting the neighbor's wife or servant or oxen. Good things that God has not given. Sometimes we neglect to examine and to know our enemy in its desires and to put those desires to death by reminding our heart, our sinful heart, oh no, oh no, God has given me 10,000 reasons to thank the Lord. You will not desire that which God has not given. You will not crave. And you know the difference between a legitimate interest in something and a pursuit of whether God might be providing it for us. I'm not saying you can never go to the store for milk because you desire to have milk in your fridge. No, this is that craving, that discontentedness with what God does not allow you to have, that craving for more when God has given less, that craving for our way when our children will not respond, that craving for respect when our spouse is refusing to give it, that thing that grips our heart and begins to fuel that internal combustion that is not pleasing to God. Why is that in the heart? Because of sin. Paul says, put it to death. Not just immorality, impurity, but passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Put not just your actions that are sin, but your desires that are sinful to death. Put them to death. Pursue them to death. This is where the war with sin should take us. And let me encourage us, when we are considering sin, we have to define it in terms of God if we're to really kill it. That's what Paul does. He says, notice that on account of these, including the desires, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Our tendency with sin sometimes is to think of it as unneighborliness. It's a bad habit. But Paul wants to redirect us to define it in terms of God. It's something against God. What I found personally helpful in this category. Because sometimes sins just don't strike me with conviction the way that they should. I'll say, well, I'm I'm lazy or I was impatient. Those terms are so familiar to me. They don't grip me with the kind of wartime mentality that they should. So I I have to redefine them in terms of something that is deserving of God's wrath. To help me understand it in terms of something that is rightly going to be the, the, <laughs> the recipient of God's wrath when he returns. So, for example, you could say, I'm, I'm prone to anxiety. And if that grips your heart with conviction and a desire to put it to death, wonderful. But if you're like me, sometimes it just doesn't. It, it might even seem like a sickness or something that I got from my grandpa. I am kind of, we're anxious in my family. So reword it in terms of something on account of which the wrath of God is coming. So don't just say you're prone to anxiety. If that doesn't grip your heart with godly and earnest zeal to put it to death, say it this way. Say truthfully that you regularly entertain doubts about God's goodness, wisdom, and power in the form of worry. 
you regularly worship your strategy above God's providence. That's what anxiety is. But doesn't that sound more like something that is deserving of the wrath of God that is coming? Denouncing the faithfulness of God in my mind? Don't merely say that you, I sometimes slip up in anger. Oh, we got a hot temper in my family. We're Italian. Say truthfully that you regularly count your time and preferences as more important than God's holiness in your life. You can do this with all kinds of sins. Find your own phrases, but reword it in a way that for you, the reality of that sin is displayed verbally. If you struggle with impatience, I, I would rather have my own way than display the patience that God has shown me. Lust. I, I don't believe that the beauty of God is valuable enough for me. Laziness. I believe I am my own master and I dictate my own life. You can do it with, with all the sins, but the point is what he's saying is you have to define sin as that which is deserving of the wrath of God that is coming. And if the wrath of God seems like it's intangible to you, let me give you a recommendation. There is no clearer way to understand the severity of sin as deserving God's coming wrath than to look backwards and see that wrath poured out in Jesus on the cross. If you want to understand the true nature of sin, go to the cross. If the words like anxiety, laziness, pride, evil desire don't grip your soul with a desire to fight, then go to the cross. You can see them in their true form. clearest way to perceive the penalty of our sin is to go to the cross of Christ. And what, what I mean by going to it is thinking about the cross as the demonstration of how serious your sin is. And trust me, the first time you do this, it won't make sense because the only reason we sin is because we don't think of it as that big a deal. And so you have to realign your mind according to the cross, according to the wrath of God. Impatience when you're driving doesn't seem like that big a deal in a world filled with war and missiles. But then you go to the cross and you redefine it as declaring to God that your timetable is better than his, your wisdom is better than his, and everybody else should serve you. And all of a sudden it looks more like cosmic treason, worthy of the Son of God suffering in your place. If you struggle with light and easy views of sin, go in your mind and in your study and think about them in terms of something that was deserving of the Son of God being crushed. Listen, God did not crush his sin for family traits, for bad habits, for slip-ups, for unfortunate tendencies, for off days, for a difficult month, for a down mood. No, he didn't die for any of those things. He died for treason against the maker. And if we define sin in that way and look at him suffering for it on the cross, that will make us want to put it to death. Thomas Wilcox says, you will never find, you will find that sin was never mortified truly if you have not seen Christ bleeding for you upon the cross. I found that to be very true in my own life. Anytime I am coddling sin, gentle with sin, explaining away sin, I have to take it to the cross, define it in terms of something that would require the Son of God to be crushed in my place, and suddenly it looks hateful and odious and something I want to get out of my life. And don't be deceived by self-pity. Oh, man, self-pity is dangerous in the fight against sin. Self-pity masquerades as guilt and conviction, but it circles around and exalts its own pride. Self-pity is just disappointed pride. Self-pity looks like conviction, but it's really just saying, I wish I was more impressive than I am. And I'm holding on to that wish rather than looking to Christ. Thomas Wilcox again says, you complain much of yourself. Woe is me. I'm terrible. I'll never grow. I'm the worst husband, wife, friend, Christian. You complain much of yourself. Does your sin make you look more at Christ and less at yourself? 
That is right. Or else complaining is but hypocrisy. Don't confuse self-pity with conviction. It just circles back on itself and declares, I so wish I was more impressive than I am. Paul is urging them to remember that the wrath of God is the rightful definition of the severity of sin so that they will kill it. And I would urge us, if we want to understand the wrath of God, to go to the cross of Christ where we see simultaneously the depth of its evil and the glory of its atonement. That's the beauty of the wisdom of the cross. It, at the same time, crushes our low views of sin and causes us to see them in the depth of their hatred against God, and at the same time exalts the Christian as one who has been paid for, so that we can say in the same phrase, Christ died for my sin, and that's why it is as evil as it is. And Christ died for my sin, and that's why it is completely forgiven. So John Newton says, thus while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace, it seals my pardon too. This is why the self-pitying Christian doesn't want to go to the cross because they want to focus on the evil of their sin and stop there, hoping that they can make up for it in the future. True conviction takes you to the cross and says, there is nothing I could do to pay for my sin except suffering for it for eternity. But Christ suffered in my place, and all of my debts have been paid in him. Paul, again, in this section, reminds them of their identity. The reason you should not be practicing these things is that you have, you have put off the old self through your union with Christ along with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There's not Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. He's, He's telling them, look, you have a new identity. Why should you kill sin? Because your identity is found in Christ. And whatever your temptation is to think, well, no, this is just a cultural issue. I'm a Greek. What do you expect? I'm a Scythian. Don't you know how hard it is to be? I'm a slave for crying out loud. Don't you know how hard it is? I'm free. This is the kind of thing free people. No, no, no. Your identity is found completely in Christ. And therefore, you should act as one who is united to Christ. heart of godliness, the war on sin, and finally, the beauty of godly character. The beauty of godly character. It is possible to think that the absence of some serious sin is the extent of our godliness. Isn't that possible to think that way? As long as I'm I'm not sinning, I'm being godly. What would we think of a farmer who cleared his field of rocks and stumps but never planted seed for a harvest to grow? What would you think of a flower bed cleared of weeds but without any flowers? What would you think a child of God who avoids sin but never cultivates godly character? What a waste. God doesn't mean for us to be neutral as if that was even possible. He meant for us to be adorned by his own character, lived out in increasing ways in our life. Put on then, he says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. It's it's as if he's reminding them yet again, your identity should drive your actions. Because you are God's chosen ones, holy, set apart, and beloved, you should robe yourselves with the attire of godliness. This is in keeping with who you are. Because God has chosen you, because he has set you apart, because he loves you, you should be adorned with the appropriate attire of godliness. Your uniform 
of godliness, your jewelry of godliness should reflect your condition of being loved and holy and chosen by God. Crucial that we get this order right. We don't adorn ourselves to make ourselves presentable so that God might consider us. We acknowledge that God has called us in his grace and lavished us with love and affection and mercy and tenderness. And now we desire to demonstrate the glory of that condition in our character. The darling of the king does not become the darling by what he wears, but he may be shown to be the darling by the ring sparkling on his finger. Paul starts his life of godly character by reminding them yet again of their identity. We are God's chosen and beloved. We could summarize this whole passage In these two major categories, love towards others and worship towards God. Love towards others and worship towards God. It begins by this horizontal category. Godly character means loving others. It means means having compassion and humility and meekness and patience and forgiveness. And above all these, he says, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. There's to be a, a horizontal expression of our godliness. To be called to Christ is to be called to godliness. And that means love towards our fellow believers in particular. Now, it's very important to notice that godliness can only take place in community. Did you notice that in this passage? You can see it even more robustly in Ephesians. Paul literally says in Ephesians, the way the body grows is that the body builds itself up in love. So we might be tempted to think of godliness as primarily a a private event, us alone, in our prayer closet, reading our our Bible and and worshiping. And, And certainly that is a major part of what godliness entails. But if that is the the primary, the exclusive definition of godliness, then we have a definition of godliness that God doesn't agree with. And it's wise if you're trying to be godly to be godly. To be godlike. And God does not simply adore himself in heaven separate from his creation. No, he, he loves. He outpours. He forgives. He is compassionate. The one who seeks to be godly in private will find they are not godly at all. The one who seeks to be godly by isolating themselves will find that they are not godly at all in, in, in the Middle Ages or thereabouts, there was a a guy named Simeon the Stylite. He was a monk. And he thought the best way to to honor God was to live on top of a pillar, which he did for years. Platform up there, and I guess they handed up his food to him and so forth. And it depicted, I guess, a sort of a separation from the world. I don't want to be earthly. I'm going to be separated. I can't be tempted by the world if if I'm separate If I was that man's pastor, I'd say, get down from there. You are being ungodly. You are being more earthly, raised up above the earth, because you're unwilling to love those that God has called you to love. We cannot be godly for two reasons, apart from community, because they are to be the recipients of our godliness. And because the scriptures make it very clear, we need them to encourage our godliness. The writer of Hebrews says, exhort one another so that you will not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So for two reasons. First of all, other people are meant to be the recipients of our godliness. They're also supposed to be the means of our godliness. So if you cut both of those pipes off, the outflow of godliness towards others and the inflow of receiving from others, you have cut off two of the major avenues or venues of being godly. 
To be godly in a biblical way is to be in community, loving others, receiving from them, and giving to them. Even this passage makes it clear we are to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. The peace of Christ is to rule in our hearts where? Where we are called in one body. So don't give in to the super spiritual notion that the most godly person is the person who rarely or never hangs out with other Christians so that they will not be tempted by them. That is an ungodly definition of life. On the other hand, it is true that our godliness is not just horizontal, it is also vertical. We are to sing songs and hymns with thankfulness in our hearts to God. We're to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's this vertical component too. So no, Christianity is not just about bettering the physical lives of those around us. It has this vertical worshiping dimension as well. As the Lord Jesus would say, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, to be called in Christ is to be called to godliness in love towards others and in worship towards God. And notice how Paul circles right back around and says the very goal of our godliness is to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. So he starts by saying, seek the things above where Christ is. Then he says, as you are expressing your gratefulness to that Christ, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Christ is both the the goal and the source and the center of our godliness from beginning to end. He is the head that creates the body within which we love and care and serve. And he is the content of our exhortation and encouragement to each other so that as he dwells in us richly, we can thank him more robustly. So that all is wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that it really is true from beginning to end. To be called to Christ is to be called to godliness. And to pursue godliness is to pursue Christ. My friends, we are called to godliness in Christ. One day at a time, one moment at a time, one I'm tired, but I guess I should still go to group to encourage others at a time, one Sunday morning at a time, one temptation on the road at a time, one resistance of that tempting screen at a time. We are called to godliness, to love, to patience, to forgiveness, to worship, to exaltation. We are not called to come on Sunday, listen, and remain unchanged. We are called to show progress, godliness, increasing in the life of the Christian. Our life is like that Lego set. We are meant to be building a life of godly character, one moment at a time. Each moment, public or private, with others or alone, is meant to display the beauty of our identity with Christ. Heaven is meant to be revealed in the hearts and fellowship and actions of God's people. The gospel is meant to be adorned with godliness so that when we reach the end of our journey, we will present our life to the Lord. Look, Lord! Look look at the progress by your grace and through your strength and by the overwhelming help of your people. Look, Look at the progress... There will be no boasting in ourselves, but there will be rejoicing in the Lord because once I walked in those sins and now, Lord, with my limited strength and with many trips and stumbles along the way, there's, there's been some progress. And now, Lord, complete it. Make me perfect as he will when he returns. But our heart should be, look, Lord, look, with the time that you gave me, I'm less sinful and more loving. I, I, I desire what you haven't given me less, Lord, 
And I'm more thankful. I'm more forgiving. I'm less self-righteous. I'm more self-controlled. I'm, I'm less indulgent. I'm more of a worshiper. I'm, I'm less of a stoic, Lord. I, I, I'm growing, Lord. Look, look what you have done by your grace, by your spirit. Look, look, Lord. To be called to Christ, the crucified and risen one, where our life is found, is to be called to run towards godliness until he returns and makes us like him. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you that your mercy is more. Lord, I am aware, Lord, I know my brothers and sisters are aware of areas where they have been accepting of their heart condition, accepting of remaining sin, lingering sins, habits and patterns, excusing. And Lord, we, we repent of that, Lord. But I... I Confess also, Lord, that there are many ways that we are not like you. Lord, that we've perhaps given up. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would fill our hearts right now by your spirit, that you would illuminate your glory, that you would, by your mighty and gracious hand, lift our chin towards heaven. Lord, that we would not be condemned by that look, but emboldened, motivated. We will be with you one day, Lord, not because of our godliness, but because of your righteousness and your death. And Lord, until that day comes, let us show progress. Jesus' name. Amen. Just wait for one minute before we dismiss and let's ask the Lord where can we show progress this week? Begin with Christ. Where is there sin you've been compromising with? Where is there godly character that's been a little dusty? not growing in your life. Where can you show progress this week? Just present that to the Lord and let him, by his spirit, guide you in what you can do practically to make progress in that area. grace to grow, Lord, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name.